Hello, Sebastian, and thank you for joining me to talk about your new book, More Money Than God, which I must say I found a fascinating read, and I really want to congratulate you. Because not only have you got great characters, great personalities, really fantastically memorable stories, you're also touching on some very big, important economic themes about where we go in the future with financial regulation. And something I find fascinating is that most ordinary people, if they pick up a book about hedge funds called More Money Than God, Hedge Funds and the Making of a New Elite, they'd assume that you've written a book that's basically bashing hedge funds, because that's been the popular line in recent years. And yet your book doesn't. Why? Well, I think that if you look at across the financial system and you say, well, there's going to be financial risk, first of all. Let's just stipulate currencies will go up and down. Interest rates will go up and down. There'll be difficult decisions about where you allocate scarce capital in an incredibly complex economy. And you'll make mistakes. There will be bubbles and crashes and so forth. Which is the least bad kind of financial vehicle in which to entrust investment capital? And I think what history shows is that hedge funds are rather good at this. I mean, during the crisis in 2007, 2008, they, they came out well. 2007, when everybody else was losing money uh, from subprime mortgage investments, the hedge funds were, on average, up 10%. Uh, even the hedge funds that were supposed to specialize in asset-backed securities, in other words, that includes subprime mortgages, they were flat for the year. So they totally b dodged the bullet at a time when, you know, everybody else was well, getting... Some of them still went bust, though. I mean, I remember writing sure. stories of myself as a journalist about funds that were going bust. So would Capital went bust in 2007, that's one example. But there were, there were several, as you say. And in fact, one of the nice things about hedge funds, one of the attractions is they do fail, but they are small enough to fail. They're not too big to fail. When they fail, they go down. And in fact, about 5,000 did go bust in the last decade. But they do so without uh, taxpayers taking a hit, without the government getting involved, and also even without creditors in general taking a hit. Because what happens is uh, hedge funds mark all their positions to market. So when they start losing money, you see it instantly. And because of the way they borrow money on a short-term basis uh, from borrowers who can sort of basically yank the loans in immediately, when they go down by about 50% or so, they tend to be wound up uh, before the lenders, the creditors, have to lose any money. So you're basically saying it's a good thing if the hedge funds do the risky stuff because they can kind of die and we don't really care. Exactly. What about long-term capital management? Because there you have an example of a hedge fund that did implode spectacularly and it created a huge almost systemic crisis. Well, I think the almost is quite interesting there. I mean, I agree with that. It is almost, but not quite. I mean, in the long-term capital management case, what happened was that the Fed came in and convened the meeting at which the bankers you know, were made to, you know, were, were arm-twisted uh, into providing a recapitalization. There was no government money involved. And in fact, Peter Fisher, the Fed official uh, who uh, convened those meetings, uh, explained to me how you know, he was getting ready to stand on the table if the bankers hadn't provided the cash uh, to tell everyone to put down their cell phones and there was going to be a public announcement at the same time so nobody could call their own bank to say that the bailout had failed. Uh, w what that story tells you is that there was no plan B for the Fed. It wasn't as though if the private sector had failed to do a bail-in, uh, the government would have come in with money uh, in the end. And so, uh, you know, long-term capital is a, a warning sign. But it did actually shape the system as a whole, because I mean, it's all very well saying, well, these hedge funds are so small, we don't really care about them. If you look at how big some of these funds have become, they're bigger sometimes, or their assets under management, than your average small bank in some countries. I mm, mean, yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you think about uh, Bear Stearns, right, which was, um, when it went down in 2007, uh, considered to be on the cusp of whether it really needed to be, and there's still a debate about that, whether you had to bail out uh, Bear Stearns. And I think Bear Stearns' assets, before it went wrong, um, were in the order of 300 billion, something like that. Uh, if you look for hedge funds which have assets of 300 billion, in other words, capital times mm -hmm. leverage, uh, they're incredibly scarce. I mean, you know, I would think that if you take the 9,000 and something hedge funds that there are, you might find a dozen, maybe two dozen, that uh, hit that criterion. Uh, so, of course, there are exceptions. The really big ones, as you quite rightly say, do warrant public attention, but they are such a small fraction of the total uh, that I think the bigger point that people need to understand is that most of these things should just be encouraged. The government should encourage hedge funds because the more but financial risk... that's not risk really what they're doing at the moment. I mean, if no. you look to Europe, the Eurozone, I mean, people talk about hedge funds being like locusts and 
there really is a sense that hedge funds are the ones who are destabilizing the system. And even in America, with the financial reform bill, there is now a requirement that hedge funds are registered and essentially subject to more scrutiny. I yeah. mean, do you think that's the right thing to do, or do you no. think that's missing the boat? Crazy, crazy. I mean, crazy. The, right. the rule in America is going to be, if you have $100 million in equity, you have to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Well, I'm sorry, $100 million is de minimis. It's nothing. It could just, you know, you could... Well, not to ordinary people, it doesn't. But no, yeah, no, but in terms of the financial funds, system, yeah. if, the, if the public uh, concern here mm. is that a hedge fund could destabilize finance, at that kind of size, you simply can't. Uh, so why is the SEC going to waste its time uh, taking all these registrations? What will it do with that information? Uh, why create a barrier to entry? When I was researching my book, I, I met um, a woman who had recently graduated from Yale Law School. Uh, and so she knew the law. And for some reason, she knew China very well. So she set up a hedge fund that would invest in Chinese bankruptcies mm -hmm. because she could figure out in a bankruptcy which piece of debt in, in, in China would pay out at what so ratio. the kind of smart entrepreneurial American dream, if you like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it, it's, you know, she went to her friends um, who had also been at Yale Law School with her. And they weren't rich because they still had some student debt. They were working for public prosecutors, whatever. But they had a few thousand dollars that they could have invested. But that is illegal in the United States because you cannot raise money as a hedge fund from investors who have less than, I think, $5 million in, in liquid investable assets. Uh, and so this is an example where, you know, well-intentioned regulation, which says, let's not have regular people invest in hedge funds. And that might be the right call. But we have to remember that the consequence is it creates a barrier to entry for these small, attractive, entrepreneurial boutiques, which ought to be managing the risk. Right. I mean, the irony is, of course, that in recent years, many of the banks themselves have started to act a bit like hedge funds. I mean, do you think that all the risky activity or the hedge fund trading should be taken out of the banks? Is that what you'd prefer? And yeah. basically, lots of the colourful characters you write about would be the only ones doing it, and the banks would be boring like utilities? I do think that um, there is a problem when you put very risky activities in basically government-insured, government-backstop institutions, which are backstop both in the sense that they take deposits which are federally insured, you know, if they have an asset liability mismatch, they borrow too much short term, they have insurance in the form of access to the Federal Reserve's lending, you know, those kinds of safeguard, and just the fact that they might be too big to fail, and therefore, you know, that's another, a third kind of backstop, um, that just encourages you to take too much risk. And it encourages your lenders to think they can lend without really scrutinizing uh, how risky you are, as you've written a lot in the Financial Times. Uh, so I think that separating out this risky activity and putting it in a vehicle where the investors, the hedge fund managers, have skin in the game. If they lose, it's their own money because they invest their own savings. It's not too big to fail. It's small enough to fail. There's no federal deposit insurance, whatever. Uh, I think that's much more healthy. So the Volcker rule, which is trying to separate out the two activities, is good in principle. The question is, in practice, drawing those lines. Well, that's going to be an issue. People are going to be fighting back for a long time because, right. of course, there's a lot to be done in terms of actually turning the financial bill into tangible rules. But, I mean, I think a lot of people who pick up your book with its fantastic title, and where did you get that idea from, by the way? I mean, was that your, um, was that your agents, your, your publishers? Did you like the title? It, it came out of a discussion with my brilliant agent, um, but it was you know, what really I mean, sealed it must have it really me. irritated a lot of hedge fund managers, it, I imagine. It, it doesn't go down too well, I'm afraid, with the hedge fund managers, but uh, hey. Um, uh, the truth is that, I mean, I think it's a fair title in the sense that when J.P. Morgan died mm -hmm. uh, in 1913, there were two facts about it. One was that he was known as Jupiter because of his godlike power of Wall Street. The second was that his entire fortune in today's dollars came to $1.4 billion. That's what <laughs> only $1.4 billion. Only I mean, a that's a lot life. of money for ordinary people. But, I mean, compared to some of the guys you write about in your book, I mean, mm -hmm. that's almost peanuts. There are plenty of guys in my book who make $1.4 billion in one year. Right? They make more money than Jupiter or more money than God in one year. So I think the title is perfectly fair. But isn't that part of the problem? Because I would bet that the real reason a lot of people would pick up this book and want to read it is actually not about the serious policy stuff, not the kind of geeky question about how you put risk in the system. They want to read it because it's a fantastic inside story of some of these characters. And these really are amazing characters. I mean, starting even with the original founder of the hedge fund idea, can you tell me a bit about you know, how and why this hedge fund concept first sprung up? Well, Alfred Winslow Jones uh, set up the first hedged fund, as he called it, in 1949. And he was an interesting character. He'd been sent to Berlin 
uh, as a young State Department official in 1930 when the Nazis were just starting to rise. He'd fallen in love with a beautiful German anti-Nazi activist. The way one uh, does, uh, yes. The way one does. And he'd, uh, you know, he became impassioned not only about her, but about her cause. Right. So he started running these undercover anti-Nazi missions, going to Britain, going to other places to try to raise money for the underground, essentially.